Christian Giri Murphy from Channel 4 News. Welcome to How Do We Know What's True? Or is it How Do We Know What's True? I was looking at that thinking it could be How Do We Know What's True? Or How Do We Know What's True? But anyway, um, <laughs> we have an amazing panel uh, with you and not a lot of time. We've got 38 minutes on the clock. So let me introduce them to you very briefly. Uh, they don't really need a lot of introduction. Um, Christian Amanpour is, of course, CNN's chief international anchor. Um, and has been everywhere and done everything. Deborah Turness is the CEO of BBC News um, and has also pretty much uh, done everything and, and been everywhere, but she is now in charge of all BBC News, so has this massive, massive responsibility. Um, Elliot Higgins is the founder of the extraordinary investigative journalism um, platform Bellingcat and is the, the pioneer, really, of open source journalism and fact-checking. And Stephen Brill is the co-CEO of NewsGuard, which is a website that tracks online disinformation and rates um, websites and news sources um, for consumers and advertisers and companies so that they can get a rating on the reliability of what they are reading. So um, we're going to plough through some big topics. And I, I'm sure a lot of our conversation is going to be framed by uh, as I'm sure the day is, the war in Israel and Gaza, because it's perhaps the most hotly contested topic at the moment in terms of, of truth. But, um, Christian, you know, your, your mantra that you're famous for um, since the Bosnian genocide has been that journalists must be truthful, not neutral. Mm. In a time where so many of the facts are now being contested, pretty much everything is contested, how does that mantra hold up? It's really hard, particularly in this particular conflict, because it also has an overarching political dimension to it, which is very difficult to navigate. My view is that when we talk about and report this story, we have to be truthful, not neutral. We have to also understand that there is nuance. We have to understand that there are two sets of victims that we can say this is wrong and this is wrong, this is right and this is right. We can hold two ideas in our head at the same time and we need to be strong and brave enough to be able to report that. I think it is incredibly difficult, uh, certainly for international, well, impossible, as we know, international journalists are not allowed into Gaza. I made that comment and was roundly uh, criticized on social media when I said to John Stewart that there are no journalists in Gaza. Obviously, there are brave Gazan journalists who've been killed, as we just heard from Alessandra. But I strongly believe that if the international press corps was allowed into Gaza, we would, A, be able to report much more of the truth of what was going on, and B, have, in my opinion, given my previous experience, an effect on the course of the war. I do believe that. I do believe that we journalists are not just passive observers, but just by doing our work, we can also have an effect on how a war is being uh, pursued. But, but essentially, truthful requires journalists to make judgments and value judgments. Yeah, truthful is truthful. Yes. I've never subscribed to this idea that truth is subjective. Truth is empirical, evidentiary, and factual. And when we go after that, then we are in a safe zone. I don't believe in subjectivity when it comes to truth. I don't believe that it's who you are, where you are, what your experience is. There, is, there are facts on the ground, and our job as journalists is to seek the facts. Elliot, um, 
you once said, we need to show there's a value to truth. If we've got to that point, we're in real trouble. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think what we're seeing more and more of are people choosing what the truth is. They go online, they find people who reinforce their own beliefs. If something's too complicated or it doesn't make them feel comfortable with what they already believe, they can find a million things that do. So you end up with a situation, and certainly around Israel and Gaza, where you're seeing more and more people basically being in information bubbles. And everyone's perception of reality becomes different. And in a democratic society, that's a really dangerous and thing. It undermines democracy fundamentally. Do you think we all agree on what truth is? You know, Christiane's just sort of defined it in her terms. Is that an uncontestable definition? I, I agree truth? in those terms, absolutely. I mean, there's plenty of people who think emotional truths are more important, but I've never really cared about that much because I want, I want to understand reality, not what people feel about the reality. Okay. Um, Deborah, you know, what, what of your big method, if you like, to bring... Uh, you know, or to uphold credibility at the BBC has been showing your working, the launch of BBC Verify. Uh, and you, you've explained that in terms of, you know, if we show people what we're doing and how we're doing it, then they will believe us more. Um, how's that going? And is there a danger that it's undermined, and, you, know, all, you know, what all your journalists were doing anyway? You create a Verify unit. What are the rest of them doing? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, I'll start with, you know, I, I think that we're talking about truth here. Um, I don't think it's necessarily truth that's the problem. I mean, truth is there, it's getting hard to find, and it's being seriously misrepresented. I think it's trust that is the issue for us, an impartial news organisation that strives to deliver fair reporting and to find, you know, BBC's number one purpose is to pursue the truth with no agenda. So the truth is very much there, alive and kicking. It's finding that it's difficult. And then it's convincing people that it is the truth. And that's where trust comes in. And that's where Verify comes in. And I do want to thank Elliot for all those years ago launching Bellingcat, because I think you showed us what open source forensic investigative journalism looks like. You showed us what it was to open up our work, pull back the curtains so that people could follow step by step the work we've done so that they would believe it. And that was before there was a significant, more significant crisis in, in trust, I think. And now we were able to sort of be, be inspired by you to bring something like BBC Verify to, to, to the sort of the mainstream. We listen to our audiences in a, in, you know, in a world of declining trust. We said, what will it take for you to trust BBC News more? And they said, we need you to share more of your workings, to be more open. If, if you know how it's made, then you can trust what it says. And that was the kind of the, the, the inspiration from the audience for BBC Verify. So we pulled together initially everybody at the BBC who was involved in data journalism, geolocation, fact check, you know, satellite tracking and pulled them all into one unit and started working on a plan in real time. And the Bellingcat work tends to be more long-term, as did BBC Africa Eye. But we're trying to do that work on the day sometimes, in real time, while you know, bearing ourselves and exposing ourselves to the audience to say, this is how we're getting there, and it's really valuable. We're tracking it. It's really resonating with audiences, particularly younger audiences. We're pushing it out on social platforms as well as our own platforms. It's going well. I believe that the transparency that you see in extreme form in Verify does need to find its way into all of our journalism. We can't only be transparent and open in BBC Verify. And you are seeing it across more of our platforms, through more of our outputs and outlets. It's the tone of voice, it's how we shoot, it's how we edit, it's how we write leadings, it's the questions we ask, the answers we give. Talk about the challenges to our journalism. Think, talk about how many sources we have. The more we do that, the more our audiences will trust us. Um, Stephen. You know, you, um, you offer a tool for people who don't know what to trust. Um, how do they know they can trust you? Well, uh, the key is the transparency that we apply to what we do. So we are transparent, we're accountable. Uh, right now, there, there are four organizations basically that judge the reliability and trustworthiness of news that you see online. Uh, there's Facebook, uh, there's YouTube and uh, there's Twitter. They all secretly rate uh, websites. Um, we don't do it secretly. You know what our ratings are. You know who did them. 
Uh, we do it according to nine apolitical journalistic uh, standards. And if people complain, uh, we air the complaints. If you were um, the editor of the New York Times, or if you were um, in charge of BBC, and you called uh, Facebook um, or Twitter or YouTube and said, is BBC rated as reliable as the Times of London? Uh, first of all, you wouldn't know whom to call. Uh, second, you wouldn't get an answer. Third, if you got an answer, then you'd say, well, how did you decide that? Well, we can't tell you that because that's our algorithm and you'd game the system. We are the opposite of that. Uh, but let me come back to the basic question here. Um, you know, as we talked about before, I have a book coming out next week called uh, The Death of Truth. Uh, so I guess I'm sort of uh, the funeral director on this panel. Um, but I do think what Christian said is absolutely correct. Um, back about uh, 30 years ago, my book opens with a scene from 30 years ago uh, when we were both uh, we were parents in uh, New York City private schools. And our daughter um, was at one school, um, our sons went to a different school, and it was a uh, visiting day for parents. And our daughter was uh, seven years old, and uh, we're standing in the back of the room, and the teacher asked one of the other students, thankfully not my daughter, um, how much is six times seven? And the kid says, 41. And the teacher says, I disagree. <laughs> Now that's the, now today, people disagree over not only that, but they disagree who got the most votes in the election. Does uh, the COVID vaccine actually kill millions of people, or does it save millions of people? Was uh, the October seventh attack um, a false flag? Um, the simple fact is uh, that fifty percent of all the people in the United States who refused vaccines and there were 25% of them, 50% of those people answered in a poll that they believed that Bill Gates had installed a microchip in the vaccine that could read their minds. Um, I'm not making that up. I mean, people don't believe anything. So the first problem we have is that uh, real journalists are drowned out and are undercut by all of that. So everything you do is undercut by that. Uh, we're going to hear this afternoon from some of the most uh, you know, courageous journalists in the world. And at a reception last night, as I heard uh, you know, Tina talking about them, my first reaction was, well, what they're doing, what they're risking their lives for, a giant, a large percentage of people aren't going to believe them because the social media platforms, and this is what my book is about, have organized their algorithms in a way that undercuts that trust. Okay. Um, Stephen's got a book out, if you haven't noticed. <laughs> um, but, and it'll be good, I'm sure. Let's come back then to the question of um, Israel Gaza uh, and talk about it in a little bit more detail. Because that whole question of trust is affecting the institutions we all work in as well, and the news organizations we work in as well. All news organizations are having this argument at the moment around bias uh, and about process and about transparency. There have been a couple of articles recently about CNN um, and whether CNN is being transparent with its audience about its script checking processes, the judgments being made, where they're being made, the Intercept claim that every script has to go through a unit in Jerusalem. I don't know whether that's true. Um, what can you say about this? Um, are you being open and transparent with your audiences? What's going on in terms of the, argue, the internal argument and well, what, how that affects what you're producing? I mean, look, all I can say is that you've read the leaks. You know, we've had internal debates. I regret that they were leaked. I don't think it's constructive. And our leadership has moved to correct that. And as the war has gone on, uh, coverage is much more transparent. But I will say, you know, I, I'm just going to say the following. We're sitting here and we're getting a lot of giggles and a lot of laughs. Truth is not dead, okay? It is not the death of truth. It's the death of where to find the truth. It is the death of, you know, good housekeeping seal of approval on legacy media and reliable media that people should be able to turn to to find. And it is 
the fact that we in the West, because we're democracies and we are liberal and we believe in the First Amendment and I don't know that, you know, the, everything will sort itself out in the capitalist system, we fail to understand that we are in a disinformation or information war. We have to be up to the struggle. We have to be up to the fight because when it comes to Israel, Gaza, for instance, and before it was Ukraine, Russia, and in my days with a much less, you know, significant social media, there was no social media, it was Serbia, Bosnia. Everywhere you go, there's propaganda and an information war. So I would uh, ju really actually shill here for Anne Applebaum, who's written the most fabulous Connecting the Dots piece about propaganda and how it affects every single thing that we, that we receive, everything that we think, everything that we're surrounded by. In The Atlantic, her latest piece is truly phenomenal. This is a organized campaign, by and large, by Russia and China and all the other illiberal democracies and autocracies and dictatorships to kill democracy, human rights, truth, and the rest of it. And when you connect the dots, for instance, just you ask about Israel Gaza. She has a, a, a paragraph about that. Uh, there was in, in France a Russian-based organization that was a fake organization that went around spraying Stars of David on the streets in France to exacerbate what's already a very difficult and politically divisive situation with anti-Semitism and the like. And then this Russian-based organization posted it all over social media and exacerbated and increased what people are already feeling. So they are at war with our system. They're at war with democracy. They're at war with human rights. But this is really fundamental to understand because we have not yet risen to that challenge, we in the West, the free and democratic press. So I think that this whole issue is so big that we, as an institution, as nations, as democracies, as the purveyors and providers of truth at the risk of our lives, by the way, you know, we need to defend that truth and that objectivity. But, but, but I mean, I mean De Deborah's approach to this is transparency. Mm -hmm. Should CNN be transparent about I think we are transparent, yeah. So are all scripts checked? You've seen it. I mean, there was a moment when that was happening, it was admitted, and that was happening. There are reasons Has for that. There, was, there were reasons for that. I've been told it stopped, I never, you know, accepted that for my work. I never will. I'm a <laughs> experienced journalist. I've been in the field much more than many of the editors. Yeah, I'd like to be the producer who yeah. tries to tell you. Yeah, um, so, yeah. <laughs> so they don't. And I have, but the important thing is I have an important platform. So on my hour, I was, you know, completely confident in everything was going on. And I use it as a convening platform for people on both sides of the conflict to talk, to come together, to, you know, to talk about what's going on and to hold officials uh, accountable. You're also facing this internal debate and it does bleach, bleed out into whether you are trusted by your audience. Yes, of course. What, what are you doing about it? Well, first of all, every single day we're delivering impeccably powerful, important journalism. And in fact, Stephen, you mentioned this afternoon's panel, you know, Jeremy Bowen is in the house somewhere and I, you know, he and other colleagues are working every single day, you know, ris risking themselves to go and tell that story. Um, and it's, it's not easy, but you know, as you kindly pointed out at the beginning of this session, um, I've been around the block somewhat uh, and I've never worked um, in such a polarized environment, this war, you know, we've covered many wars in our, in our um, careers. Neither have I ever worked for an organization that is so scrutinized. Now that scrutiny is absolutely correct. The BBC is a publicly funded organization and is accountable to those who pay for it. Um, however, you know, we've had over 4,000 complaints saying that we are pro-Israeli and we've had over 4,000 complaints saying that we are pro-Palestinian. That doesn't mean to say that we sit there and look at the numbers and say, well, they mess. They don't cancel they each cancel other out. out. They, they could both be true. Not. Well We really have got it wrong, and we do get it wrong sometimes. But I think the point is, and I come back to transparency, um, it's about saying, you know what, that's correct. We got that wrong. Get out there quickly, own it, correct it, and move on. And if there's something systemic, then deal with it. And, and we certainly look at the sort of public monitoring of trust. And what we're finding right now is in terms of when people are asked, who do you most trust uh, for impartial coverage of this particular war, 
the BBC comes out on top to, to, to a multiple of four to the nearest other news provider. So we, we believe we're getting something right, but we don't get it right all the time. And Just on transparency, because I've, yeah. I've had, you know, as always happens when you get a BBC boss on stage, you get BBC staff contacting you to say, I hear you're grilling the boss tomorrow. Can you ask her this? Um, Thank you. And I have had... I think you called them. Um, a very, <laughs> I have contacted nobody. And actually, I had a very serious senior presenter contact me, who is not a friend of mine, I barely know them, um, who said, why, when you're about transparency, why isn't the BBC being more transparent about um, the fact that journalists from, the, from our organisations are not in Gaza? Why don't you make that clear in your coverage, perhaps every day, in some form? Um, and why don't you call as an organisation for access? You know, we've all well, called for access. First of all, we have, as organisations, yeah. we've written yeah. strong letters we'll have and we have called for access for all internationals to Gaza yeah. and we yeah. wrote letters and we signed them high level and we also called, along with all of our uh, media heads, to protect the safety of those Palestinian journalists who are in Gaza. So we have actually done yeah. that. And on that, the Committee to Protect Journalists, um, you know, are representing a group of media and I signed an open letter which has been sent. We're also lobbying the Supreme Court of Israel for access. So that is absolutely being done. But I think it's important to say that for the first months of the war, we did have journalists in Gaza. We had Rushdie Abu Alouf, um, yeah, who, works, who works for us there, as well as an entire BBC Arabic team. We got them out in February. So yeah. up until February, the BBC did have teams reporting for Gaza every single day, staying there, they and their families, you know, really living in danger. We eventually got them out. And actually, we are now really lobbying to be able to go back in and to tell the story again. And I think that has been, it's been critical that we do that. On air, we do mention it, but you're right. We don't do it every single day and maybe we should. And I'll be transparent about that and say, and Jeremy, who's here again, does actually very regularly mention that we are not able to go and report from Gaza. I know you want to move on, but just one really calamitous catastrophe and, and consequence of this is actually our journalists in London who catch stuff, as we call it, and then put out the Gaza reporting, they're told, why aren't you there? You know, we, we, you don't want to be here to tell our story. Yeah. So they're being told that we're voluntarily not going. Yes, people are thinking that's the yeah. norm, that, yes, and that it's, that it's a choice. Um, Elliot, what can your kind of journalism, much of which is done behind a computer screen, you know, what, how can it help? Well, um, one thing with open source investigation is it's using publicly available materials. So um, that transparency is really at the core of the work we're doing. But something that's often overlooked at, with the success of Bellingcat is it's not just about the investigation process, but it's the community that's around that. Um, when you think in terms of countering disinformation, for example, often it's done this way where people, you know, especially after the 2016 election, set up a lot of this counter disinformation websites with fact checks. The problem is that wasn't really getting anywhere because that has to be something that's communicated through online communities. And those have to be communicated to not just those communities, but the people who are spreading disinformation. Maybe they're doing it on purpose, maybe they don't know what they're doing. But without that community, it's very hard to actually get these messages to the people who need to hear it. The way people have cons are consuming information is changing as well. We're moving away from these top-down, gatekeeped models to peer-to-peer -peer models. And I don't think we're adapting very well to that. If you think that a young person will get their first smartphone at you know, 11, for example, I mean, there was an Ofcom survey that said something like a quarter of UK three and four-year-olds have a smartphone. But um, if you're getting a smartphone at 11, your media consumption is through social media. It's currently through TikTok. It'll be probably some new thing in 10 years' time. But if we're just leaving that space open and not educating young people how to be participants in that space like they want to be, then we're just going to see them finding stuff that reinforces their beliefs. It's emotionally engaging. It doesn't really present facts. It presents you know, these emotional truths. And you end up with an increasingly fractured society um, starting at a really young age. And that's why I think education has to be really important in this solution. It's not just about what the media can do, but it's about what we can do as a society to address what is ultimately a social issue. Yeah, I mean, Steve, Stephen, I mean, if, if you look at how young people in particular are um, viewing this, this war, um, it is so different to how it's being covered in yeah. mainstream legacy, whatever you call it, traditional oh, that's media. Right. And, you know, the, the, the impression that they are getting of what is happening is, is quite different. You know, and, and it, it kind of bounces back. You know, my Instagram is now flooded with the most horrific material 
of, full of angry people saying, well, why aren't you showing this every night? Why aren't you doing this? You know, what, why are you, where, where are your priorities? So, so how, how do you, well, how do you arbitrate the truth there as well? But also, how, how, you know, how do you reach that audience well, with our traditional values, I suppose? I'm glad you asked that question. I've been listening to this conversation and, um, you know, obviously it's important, you know, that CNN or BBC or Channel 4, you know, keep to the highest standards and, the, and that there be debate about the transparency. But those are really debates around the edges. The question you asked, um, you know, more kids are seeing the truth or the lack thereof on, uh, you know, TikTok than they are on BBC. And more kids are seeing videos on TikTok often that hijack the CNN logo or the BBC uh, logo and put all kinds of fake reports on and they think it's Christian Amanpour in CNN or they think it's someone from BBC. Um, they're, uh, you know, just to take an example, there was a report related to uh, the war in Gaza where, um, where um, a Russian uh, you know, Facebook account uh, did, a, did um, a video uh, that was a complete phony that said it was a false flag. The yeah. attack was a false flag. So, so, you know, that's debating sort of the ultimate basics of the story, right? Um, that video um, a report on Facebook uh, was picked up by the Russian embassy in South Africa, where the ambassador then tweeted it to the UN uh, Russian embassy in New York who tweeted it out and it became a story. It's as if it had actually happened. Those kinds of operations are happening every minute of every day and that's what's undercutting you know, the work uh, that CNN and BBC and all the credible news organizations do. It's not that, uh, you know, the, uh, the real issue for me isn't, uh, you know, how many times a day, uh, uh, you know, CNN says, well, we're not really in Gaza, but we'd like to be. The real issue is how do we deal with all this other stuff? Yeah. Yeah. Um, the 25, I mean, I mean, 30, I mean, 40% of the people believe it. I know, I know you're working with schools and colleges a lot. I mean, I've got a 17 year old who watches a lot of fake news with his friends and they kind of think it's fun. You know, they say, yeah, we know it's not true. But what that means is that their feeds are flooded with rubbish. And so it's harder and harder for them to discern, you know, the truth because they're watching so much total nonsense. And I think if we aren't educated, we can't be surprised when that happens. I mean, if you look at the state of education in the UK around media literacy, it does have this focus on, oh, how do you spot what a false headline is? But I think we have to go a lot deeper than that. We can't just show them, you know, this isn't true. We need to show them, here's how you can find the truth. But most importantly, we need to show them that when they find the truth, it actually matters. Because a big driver for people to be drawn into conspiracy theories and disinformation is because they believe that the sources of authority who are supposed to fix these things don't. They ignore them. They're actively working against them. So if we're teaching young people about value of the truth and then nothing happens, then they're going to feel that sense of betrayal and it'll just reinforce the cycle we're already in. Did you want to come in on the... Yeah, the fake. So, so with Verify, you know, we, we really have flooded the zone on TikTok with Verify because it's working with younger audiences and it is that media literacy piece. And one of our most popular stories recently was, I don't know if anybody caught it, there was a, a kind of a big story on TikTok, which was the Eiffel Tower was on fire. <laughs> and we did a piece saying, this is why and how we know the Eiffel Tower is actually not on fire. Now that might seem like a silly story, but by deconstructing the story and showing how and why we know that actually that's fake that's fake footage. It was very important. But one thing I, th I think for me, what worries me most is that what we're seeing, and we're seeing it through Israel Gaza, is that we're at a stage now where subscription culture meets algorithm. And you've got so many people spending so much of their time consuming news, which because of algorithms or because of subscriptions they've chosen, is, is channeling, it's their echo chamber, it's their point of view, that when they actually do come up for air and meet impartial news, they feel that it is attack on their values. And that's what we've got to really worry about. And every day I walk to work past the statue of George Orwell and etched into the stone of New Broadcasting House, it says, quote from George Orwell, if liberty means anything at all, it means the right to tell people what they do not want to hear. Now that was put there 10 years ago before we were where we are today, 
but the value of those words, and to me, they are, they are a solemn commitment for all of the journalists at the BBC. We must keep on fighting to show people you know, every version of what's happening, the, the, the broad spectrum of fact. They can make up their own minds, but that is increasingly becoming an affront to audiences, and that is the thing that actually yeah. most concerns me. And we, we may be about to reach a peak on this again, mightn't we, after the next US election? Um, if Trump wins, how do you think CNN and American news you know, organizations will approach it differently? Well, look, I what don't have they know. learned? I don't know. Do you think that our news organizations are approaching the campaign or the coverage of Trump any differently no. now? No. <laughs> and we have eight years uh, of experience since he was first elected, right? Um, so it worries me. It does worry me. It worries me that uh, MAGA Americans uh, are also being duped or are useful idiots for the Russian Chinese propaganda model. Uh, it is absolutely clear that a lot of MAGA Americans believe that Putin and his white Christian nation, anti-LGBTQ, full of culture wars and this and that, is an American ally. That's what they think, according to the polls. So you've got a war within a war within a war that is corrupting a significant number of American thought, and it's very, very dangerous. And I don't know what is going to happen. I, I certainly think the war on truth is going to go into, if, if it's possible, even higher gear. And the truth of the matter is that Donald Trump is an expert communicator. He has a message. It's simple. He repeats it. He states it. He repeats it. He, he then repeats it again. And it never changes. I mean, I was listening to the New York Times Daily podcast last night on, uh, I mean, a serious podcast by Nate Cohen, you know, the, 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 the numbers guru, who was saying that in certain uh, swing states, uh, Trump is ahead. Okay, we're several months out from the election, but nonetheless today. And it turns out that people who were asked, especially young people, were asked about change. That's what they wanted more than anything, change. But who did they identify with change? Donald Trump. But then were they asked what kind of change? that he had brought and he might bring again. You know, it's, 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 very, it's very surface value, all of this. And I agree that there's just not enough um, much more deep education and information. By the way, we've just spent, what, 35 minutes and we haven't even brought up Ukraine, Russia. I mean, that's a huge deal that we need. To, it's even more dangerous for our security, for the, for, the, for the survival of truth, than even the Gaza-Israel war. If Russia wins, the entire of Europe and the United States of America, the whole North Atlantic, is at major risk. And not just physically, but in the truth and propaganda domain. Just very briefly on that, do, do you think um, public service broadcasters in this country are impartial on Ukraine-Russia? I think it's very difficult because I think it's about the truth and what's being represented as the truth in Russia and by Russia's allies isn't actually the truth. So we are in pursuit of the truth and we call out the truth when we see it and we call out what's not true when we see it. Can I pick up on something Christian said? In terms of Trump, how do we... I ran NBC News in the lead-up to Trump's election in 2016. Um, how do we deal with the fact that not everybody who's going to vote for Donald Trump is stupid? Did I say that? No, but I think there's a danger I that if we think they've all been misinformed, that they've all been duped by fake news and, and in, an, incredibly, fake news. an incredibly powerful communicator. Yes. Genuinely, I'm asking you, sort of, uh, yeah. what do we do? Because what we do is otherwise we're in danger of cornering ourselves yeah. and those audiences won't come to us and we create an echo chamber. They won't receive our impartiality and all our pursuit yeah. of truth. And well, we'll first be, of all, I'll we'll be preaching with to the, the word choir. impartial because I don't really know what it means. But um, yeah. I think it, it means that, fairness and respect for audiences. I yeah, agree with yeah. you. It's a difficult but word. Is it mm. neutral? Is it objective? What I believe in objectivity. Mm. Objectivity. That's what I believe in. Um, so the idea of asking whether the BBC, the national broadcaster, is impartial on a major war in Europe. I mean, what if we were in World War II right now? What if World War II was about to, 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 to explode? Would we say, are we impartial on the Nazis' desire to overrun the world? No, <laughs> no, we are not impartial. We should not be impartial. We should be objective and truthful and, and be 
up to the fight that's in front of us. Seriously, none of this is going to matter if we're not. None of this is going to matter, right? I'm, I mean, journalism is the fourth pillar of a democratic civil society. If you want to see where that comes really down to, you just have to look at Trump and America. <coughs> I, when you look at these conspiracy communities, they generally are echo chambers and bubbles until someone from the mainstream becomes the bridge. And what happened in America, we had Fox News becoming that bridge. We had the Republican Party becoming that bridge. And that pulled those conspiracy theories into those circles. And it became part of the Fox News, Newsmax news cycle. What I found very interesting when we were looking at COVID conspiracy theories, you'd have a cycle every day. Donald Trump would give a pre his daily press conference, say something insane, stupid, false. That would then be laundered by the alt-right media immediately, saying, oh, he was trying to trigger the libs, or the libs don't understand that kind of stuff. And then that would be picked up by Newsmax and Fox News, all within 24 hours. And then Donald Trump it would go into his brain, and it would start again. And that was a constant cycle, but that generated disinformation. And that's because those people who are the gatekeepers to this information weren't acting responsibility. You know, I think we're ignoring a big part of the problem, and that is the economics of this problem. Um, we haven't said a word yet about how social media has an incentive to do everything uh, that Chris John is talking about. That's how they make money. That's what we discovered right after the 2016 election, and it's only gotten worse, and it's going to get worse still uh, with generative AI. We haven't talked about something that very few people appreciate and talk about, which is how the advertising industry, the ad agencies, through programmatic advertising, have created a machine in which 80% of advertising goes to websites where the advertiser has no idea where they're advertising. Two years ago, you know who the biggest financial supporter of Russian propaganda was? Anyone have a guess? Warren Buffett. What? Warren Buffett, uh, through Geico. And it's not like Warren Buffett wakes up every morning and says, how can I send more money to Putin? It's his ad agency and the ad tech companies, which have been running this scam now for 15 years, where they say, this is just this dramatically economically efficient thing called programmatic advertising, which two thirds of the people in this room probably have never heard of. And that sends advertising. The typical brand uh, uh, is on 45 different, uh, 45,000 different websites at a time, all done through an auction. I'll give you one example. Uh, when Paul Pelosi was attacked in his home in San Francisco, that night, a story ran on a website called the Santa Monica um, Observer, which is a phony uh, website. It had actually run a story which got, us, uh, which got us onto them in 2018, that Hillary Clinton died in 2015, and a body double had participated in the debates with Trump. It ran a story that said that Paul Pelosi was actually in an encounter with a gay prostitute. Uh, Elon Musk retweeted it, Donald Trump retweeted it. They got an avalanche, millions of dollars worth of programmatic advertising from Best Buy, Coca-Cola, Disney, um, uh, you know, Pepsi, you name the brands. They all advertised there, Hertz Renicar. They didn't advertise on the San Francisco Chronicle, which actually pays reporters to do real stories, including what actually happened uh, to Paul Pelosi. Well, could you also just say, because we're, we're really in the last minute, sadly we don't have another 40 minutes, about, and the thing we haven't talked about at all is AI. Um, so so, so how, how easy does AI make it for more of these fake websites peddling uh, nonsense? It's, it's totally easy. One of our, uh, one of our analysts uh, um, a week ago um, found a guy on uh, the web um, in Pakistan gave him $104 and launched the Ohio Observer or something, a fake newspaper in Ohio. Um, for two days, he said, uh, do stories in favor of the Democratic candidate for the Senate in Ohio, uh, you know, Sherrod Brown. And it pumped out these stories how Sherrod Brown's a believer in, in high school graduations and in Little League baseball. And then he switched and said, now do stories you know, in this totally fictional website that looks like the Cleveland Plain Dealer, 
and it got a t- you know it gets advertising and it gets out there. It took him $104. He didn't have to do anything. He didn't type anything. He didn't do anything. It just did it. Well, um, ladies and gentlemen, um, <laughs> on a slightly scary note, um, we're going to have to wrap it up. I'm really sorry. There's loads we could have got to that we haven't had time to get to. I'm just going to throw away half the notes. Um, but that's what happens when you have four great people on the panel. I hope we've set the scene for you. You've got the rest of the day to, exactly. to get into the <laughs> to detail. Thank you very much Thank indeed. You.